Good morning. This is John Hesse, Cahoka Presbyterian Church. Um, <coughs> thankful to have you following along today. Uh, we're, we'll be reading from Daniel chapter 2, verse 47, through chapter 3, verse 6. And the title of the message is Promoted and Tested. Uh, before we read and get into the word, I'd like to go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much that you give us your word for our instruction. And, and some of what we read is straightforward instruction. Some of it is in the form of stories, interesting stories, and in many cases, stories we may be familiar with and may have heard all of our lives. But in every case, therefore, our instruction, so that we can learn more of your character, so that we can recognize more of our own character, and so that you can use those things to draw us closer to you. We ask that you'd work all of these things in each of our lives as we do this. In Jesus' name, amen. Daniel chapter 2, verse 47 through 3, verse 6. Okay, <clears throat> Daniel has just interpreted King Nebuchadnezzar's troubling dream. And in verse 46, Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and, and commanded that they should make an offering to Daniel because, well, because Nebuchadnezzar recognized that there was a great power in Daniel and that Daniel was able to do things that none of the other wise men were able to do. And since he didn't know the God of Israel, he attributed that to, to Daniel himself. And in 47, the king answered Daniel and said, Truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets. Since you could reveal this secret. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and the chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Also Daniel petitioned the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. Uh, we'll just go over those first, and then we'll get into chapter 3. Now, <clears throat> the king answered Daniel in verse 47 and said, Truly your God is a God of gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. This sounds like Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Nebuchadnezzar at least, and as, as we read further, we're, we're driven pretty much to the conclusion that, that Nebuchadnezzar recognizes that the God of Daniel is greater than any of the gods that he has grown up worshiping. But that's not the same thing as having come to a place of faith and trust in the God of Daniel or the God of heaven or the true God. Um, but when he says truly, the word that's translated truly emphasizes fidelity or faithfulness. You have uh, in Daniel 4, verse 37, again, this is Nebuchadnezzar speaking. Some time later, quite a few years later, and after he has had the opportunity through great hardship to expand upon the knowledge that he initially confessed. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth, same word, uh, representing fidelity or faithfulness. And his ways, justice, and those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. And, and we'll deal with this more as we get through that part of Daniel. But pride is something that you see in Nebuchadnezzar's life. And pride is something that is an almost universal temptation. In, in part because we want to be, and, and there is nothing wrong with being recognized for abilities that God has given us, for things that we have been able to do. That's, that's part of how we are created is, is that recognition. Where it comes into sin is where we attribute those things to ourselves. 
You say, you know, I was able to do this because I'm smart, because I worked hard to do it, or, or whatever. And all of those things may be true, but it is God who gives us that ability. Um, if we excel in anything, there, <clears throat> it is likely that, that that achieving of excellence involved a great deal of work on our part, but the ability to do that work and to develop that ability came from God. And the initial gifting, whatever, I mean, in whatever area it is, whether it's in terms of scientific, whether it's in terms of artistic, whatever area it is, that, that initial ability came initially from God, plus the determination, the drive, and the willingness to develop that ability and to, uh, to uh, create a, uh, a high degree of skill in it. And then in verse 47 of chapter 2, your God is the, is the God. He's recognizing that he's faithful in that. The Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets. Secrets refers specifically here to dreams. He's revealed a dream. He's referring back to, uh, in the same chapter, chapter 2 of Daniel, verses 22, 28, and 29, all of which uh, Nebuchadnezzar had had this mysterious dream that frightened him and that he was unable to explain, and all the other wise men and the astrologers were unable to explain. Going on to verse 48. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and the chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Now in Daniel 2, verse 6, when Nebuchadnezzar has first had this dream, he promises that whoever can interpret the dream will receive great gifts and, and he makes good on this promise to Daniel I, I would like to read a couple of <coughs> verses written by Solomon in the book of Proverbs Proverbs 14 35 and Proverbs 21 verse 1 and these are dealing both with how God works through giftings and abilities Proverbs 14, 35. The king's favor is toward a wise servant, but his wrath is against him who causes shame. And Daniel was indeed a wise servant, and he received the king's favor. In Proverbs 21, verse 1, the king's heart is is in the hands of the Lord, like the rivers of water. He turns it wherever he wishes. Now, is Solomon saying here that the godly king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, like the rivers of water? He turns it wherever he wishes. No, he makes no such distinction. That God is not some mighty but not almighty God. God is an almighty God, and he can even turn the hearts of a king like Nebuchadnezzar, who didn't know the God of Israel, who didn't know the true God of the universe. But God worked in his heart to bring about, to set his men, Daniel, and his friends, um, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, or by their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in places of prominence to pr to provide for and protect his people who were in a time of judgment. They'd been conquered by a foreign nation because of their unfaithfulness to God. And yet even in that place of judgment and testing and trial, God provided a protection for them. He provided a place where those who were faithful to him rose to positions of prominence. And he became, Daniel became the chief administrator over, over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel 4, verse 9, and 5, verse 11, both refer to this. And I would like to read um, 4, verse 9. Daniel 4, verse 9. Okay, <clears throat> now this is Nebuchadnezzar speaking again some years later. Uh, to read the entire story, you would need to read from verse 1 
in 4 um, and pretty much the rest of the chapter. But Nebuchadnezzar is speaking and he calls Daniel by his Babylonian name at verse 9, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy God is in you and that no secret troubles you. Explain to me the visions of my dream I have seen and its interpretation. Excuse me. A couple of things there that we'll probably go into more detail when we get to that chapter, but... <coughs> But Nebuchadnezzar calls Daniel the chief of the magicians. Uh, magic is strictly forbidden in the Old Covenant. But this is not a godly man speaking. This is a pagan king. And most of this pagan king's counselors were those who uh, were practitioners in occult practices. They were magicians with a K. Uh, as opposed to sleight of hand artists some were probably a little of both but <clears throat> Daniel was referred to as the chief of the magicians because Daniel had been chief administrator over all of those who were in those positions of authority he was not somebody who understood the law of God he was speaking from his perspective and his understanding okay and Daniel had been promotion promoted because of his wisdom and his faithfulness <clears throat> to the to the position of chief administrator also verse 49 Daniel petitioned the king and he set Shadrach Meshach and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon but Daniel sat in the gates of the king now Shadrach Meshach and Abednego are mentioned again in Daniel 3 verse 12 And, and they are specifically mentioned by those who are accusing them who bring this accusation. There are certain Jews who have used, whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry about that. So that accusation is, is brought against them. Uh, and they're mentioned again in, in uh, chapter 3. And it says that Daniel sat in the gates of the king. Now, for most of us, that doesn't mean very much. But to, in ancient times and in ancient cultures, in almost every ancient culture, there wasn't a county courthouse or a city courthouse. If you had to bring something before a government official... The first place, the cities were walled for the protection of the cities, both from wild animals and from, from foreign enemies. And so the first place you would go is the gate of the city. And the city officials would be sitting, when it was time to conduct business, they'd be sitting at the gate. That's where the city officials sat. That's where they conducted business. So to sit at the gate was to, to be in a place of authority. You have some examples of that in the book of Esther. We've got a contrast here in, in the references. Two of the references deal with Mordecai, or one of the references deals with Mordecai, and one of the references deals with <coughs> his enemy Haman. And Esther... Chapter 2, as soon as I find it, verses 19 through 21. And this is just, <clears throat> I'm just reading this in terms of sitting at the gate as a position, position of authority. When virgins were gathered together a second time, Mordecai sat within the king's gate. So Mordecai is in this position of authority. It's not a major position of authority, but he is an official of the court of, of Babylon. Now Esther had not revealed her family or her people, just as Mordecai had charged her. 
For Esther obeyed the command of Mordecai as when she was brought up by him. In those days, while Mordecai sat within the king's gate, that position of authority, two of the king's eunuchs, Big Than and Teresh, doorkeepers, became furious and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. They sought to kill him, and, and it's an interesting story, and I encourage you to read the book of Esther. It doesn't really take a long time. Uh, chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, somebody else sitting at the gate. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. So he has a position above everyone else. And all the king's servants who were within the king's gate all the minor officials, of whom one of them was Mordecai, bowed and paid homage to Haman. For so the king had commanded concerning him, but Mordecai would not bow or pay homage. So that Haman had been set up in, in position of essentially second in command, and all the lesser officials were, were to bow and pay homage to him, and Mordecai would not. And Amos 4 or I mean, Amos chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. Hosea, Joel, Amos, here's Amos, chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. Now this is God, again, <coughs> speaking to those who are in positions of authority or in the terminology of the time, those who sit within the gate. Seek good and not evil that you may live. So the Lord God of hosts will be with you as you have spoken. Hate evil, love good, establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Again, if we didn't know that, if you just read establish justice in the gate, you'd wonder what in the world is that all about? But, but if we know that the gate of the city was where the officials of the city um, conducted their business, then it makes more sense. So, <clears throat> Mordecai, Mordecai, sorry. So, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are sitting are over the provinces of Babylon, and Daniel sits in the gate as a city official. And not just a city official, a national official. Chapter 3. Verses 1 through 6. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its width 6 cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar set word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered together for the ded dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyra, and the psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Now, we're no, not going to read that entire story today. Um, I, I do encourage you to, to read ahead to that, and we will be getting into that next week. <clears throat> and for those of us who grew up in... in uh, an environment hearing Bible stories, whether in a home or in a church, it's a familiar story. Uh, but there's a lot in it. But it says that he made an image whose height was 60 cubits and its width was 6 cubits. Well, since I don't think probably anybody measures in cubits anymore, the obvious question is, okay, how big is this image? Uh, it's 90 feet tall and nine feet wide. You have something that's very tall and for its height, very, very skinny. And, I mean, it's only nine feet wide, so that really isn't all that much. Um, <clears throat> whatever this image is, and it doesn't specify exactly what the image is. 
and, and, and historians have made a lot of guesses, um, but whatever it is, the people were commanded to worship it as being representative of Nebuchadnezzar. It was something that was, was to represent his power and his authority. Verse 2, And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word together, together, and this list is repeated twice in verse 2 and verse 3. The satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces. And, and this listing is repeated twice. Now, it would be shorter to just say, to gather together all the, all the city, county, and national officials. It would, but in this case, uh, the author, the human author, is making sure that nobody is left out, that, that we have a clear understanding of just exactly what types of officials were um, being invited. Now, one word that has uh, changed in its meaning somewhat is that with the word that's translated judges, the treasurers, the judges. In Babylonian times, the judges were those who rendered judgment by divination or astrology. I mean, it, it referred not, not just to somebody who had a thorough understanding of the Babylonian law, but somebody who used divination. And astrology in order to render a judgment. And I, I thought that was kind of an interesting um, detail. Then the herald cried aloud, and he, he uh, says, At that time you hear, you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, harp, lyra, and psaltery. Hear means literally to hear and to obey. And, and you know, we, we've probably all heard this. You heard me, but did you really hear me and with, you know chances are pretty good that it, at some point if we've had children we've probably said something like that probably something that we heard from our parents and said we'd never say to our children but hmm surprise <laughs> well it was happening then too going on to verse six so all these officials are, ca are, are brought there, and not just major officials, minor officials, the most minor of officials, because this image has been set up so that this image, whatever it physically looked like, was to be a representation of Nebuchadnezzar as a king, and not just a human king, but he was asking to be, in verse 6, and whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. He was not just asking for the honor that would be due a king. Kings and those who are in authority, I mean, I didn't grow up in a monarchy. I, I really don't have much understanding of, of kings, and most kings that are on the world now are in constitutional monarchies, and so they their power is, is more uh, symbolic than actual but <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar like tyrants before and tyrants since have wanted more than just the authority that is due those who are in authority because God give, commands us to give authority to those who are in positions of authority to give respect and, and, and that's not even really based on whether they're deserving of that but because of that position, because God has, is using them in that place of authority. We may be called upon to resist them if they're demanding of us something that goes against the law of God, but even if we are called to resist or in, in, as we move into a time perhaps of greater disobedience to the will of God, even when we are called to resist, we are called to resist not from a rebellious heart and attitude, but from an attitude of submission to the things that we can submit in and submission to the law of God in the things that we cannot submit to the law of man in. Still respecting and praying for those who are in, in that position of authority. Okay, the fiery furnace and Nebuchadnezzar are mentioned in Jeremiah 29 
It's a different situation entirely, but this was a method of execution that was used in the time of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 21 through 22. Now, this is speaking concerning a couple of false prophets. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, concerning Ahab, the son of Kolaiah, and Zedekiah, the son of Masaiah, who prophesy a lie to you in my name. Behold, I will deliver them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall slay them before your eyes. And because of them, a curse shall be taken by all of the captivity of Judah who are in Babylon, saying, May the Lord make you like Zedekiah and Ahab, whom the king of Babylon roasted in the fire. So this, this method of execution wasn't initially devised. Um, it had been used before Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are, were put to the test with it. But we aren't yet to the point where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego face that test. So, uh, in, in terms of the title promoted, Daniel's promoted. Who is being tested here? Well, Nebuchadnezzar himself is being tested. And, and a lot of times we'll read this story, or at least a lot of times I've read this story and not really thought about Nebuchadnezzar being tested. But at the end of chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar makes the confession that your God, speaking to Daniel, your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings. Nebuchadnezzar is making a confession that is entirely true, but it hasn't really penetrated his heart. Because he goes on to make this image of gold, to have it to be made, which, I mean, however long it took, it wasn't just made overnight. And to send out the proclamation that everybody was to be brought together to worship this image that was to represent his power. Okay, so Nebuchadnezzar has made the proclamation that the God of Daniel is the God of gods and the Lord of all kings. And yet here he is acting as though he is the God of gods and the Lord of all kings. He is being put to the test. And at this point, he's not doing very well with the test. Um, sometimes we all get put to, to, to tests and we may not recognize it as a test because a test can come in what appears to be painful and difficult and hard and that's easier to recognize as a test or something that appears to be a promotion something that appears to be a really really good thing because the test is not the thing itself the test is how am I going to respond to it am I going to respond in in, a, in pride or am I going to respond in a way that honors God? And it's just as much or more of a test when we go through those times of prosperity than it is when you go through those times of adversity. And of course, the officials, the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, and the judges were also being tested. Now, most of them really would have had no understanding of who the true God of the universe was. But they were being tested. And so you could say, well, they're totally excused. Well, is that really true? Because even if you don't know anything about the true God of the universe, and certainly there are many people who don't, if some human king, if some human tyrant, if some human dictator issues a decree that he is to be worshipped as God and you know that he is a human being and at some point he's going to die. Now, you may not believe that there's a judgment and you may not believe that you'll face a judgment or that he or she will face the judgment, but but you, what we do recognize just through life itself that everybody dies. I mean, soon we may extend our lives for some time, but every one of us at some point is going to die. And if somebody is, is claiming that he or she is a god and needs to be worshipped as a god, it's pretty obvious that that is patently false. It can't possibly be true. And so they also were being tested. 
And as we read further next week, we'll find out more, of course, about the testing of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But they also were being tested. Um, <clears throat> now, the fiery furnace was a literal fiery furnace here. But it's used as a symbol of judgment upon sin in Ezekiel 22, 17 through 22. Ezekiel 22, 17 through 22. The word of the Lord came to me. This is Ezekiel speaking, saying, Son of man, the house of Israel has become dross to me. They are all bronze, tin, iron, and lead in the midst of a furnace. They have become dross from silver. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, be, because you have all become dross, therefore, behold, I will gather you into the midst of Jerusalem. As men gather silver, bronze, iron, lead, and tin into the midst of the furnace to blow fire on it, to melt it, so I will gather you in my anger and in my fury, and I will leave you there and melt you. Yes, I will gather you and blow on you with the fire of my wrath, and you shall be melted in its midst. As silver is melted in the midst of a furnace, so you shall be melted in its midst. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have poured out my fury on you. Now, this is a very, uh, I'm God is speaking to a sinful people. And he's promising, in, in the case of Ezekiel, that he's going to bring his judgment upon them because of their sin. But what comparison does he use? Does he say, I'm going to gather you as wood, hay, and, and uh, stubble into the midst of a fire and pour out this fire upon you? No. What is the difference between wood, hay, and stubble and iron, lead, and tin? Wood, hay, and stubble are all consumed in the fire. There's nothing left but ash. Wood, hay, and stubble are melted down and separated, and the silver is separated from the other metals. That at the end of that testing and that, that trial, which is a, it's a trial. It's not going to seem pleasant. But at the end of that trial is a refining, and the silver is brought forth. In Matthew 13, 47 through 50, Matthew 13, 47 through 50, Again, and this is Jesus speaking. The kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore. And they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Again, a furnace of fire is used as a symbol of, a symbol of judgment. But in this case, the wicked are thrown into it, and there is no refining. This is after the period of refining. It is a symbol of utter destruction. Revelation 9, 1 and 2 also speaks of that burning, that destructive burning judgment. Revelation 13, 13 through 15, which I'd like to read. Revelation 13. 13 through 15. Now this is speaking of a fire of judgment <coughs> coming not from God, but a deceiving fire of judgment. And uh, the context starts, starts in verse 11. I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. Uh, verse 13, he, he, this beast, performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of all men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as who would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. 
So he makes an image and then demands worship. Does that sound familiar? Hmm. Nebuchadnezzar did much the same thing. Ne now, Nebuchadnezzar had a, you know, <clears throat> he didn't call it, he wasn't able to, through his magicians, call down fire from heaven, but he did have a fiery furnace prepared for those who were not willing to worship this, this image that he had dedicated that was supposed to be representative of him. This false prophet, whoever he is, has the ability to call down fire from heaven to those who will not worship the image. Revelation 14, verses 9 through 11. <clears throat> then a third angel, and now this is um, the proclamations of three angels. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice. Now this is referring back to what we just read. If anyone worship the, worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on, on his hand. Now, there's a lot of speculation, and I, I don't want to go way down a, a rabbit hole here. There's a lot of speculation uh, as to what exactly is the mark of the beast. And, and there are some, some strong clues in the book of Revelation. But one thing that is certain is that you're not going to accidentally receive the mark of the beast. If you receive the mark of the beast, you will know exactly what you're doing. It is, it is for those who are willingly worshiping this as and, and knowing that it is not the true God. It says, He himself shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever, whoever receives the mark of his name. Now, that's a very sobering thing to read. I mean, it, it truly is. It's a downright scary thing to read. And <clears throat> it's there as a warning. It, it's, it's there so that as we later find out Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were, were willing to stand up for the true and living God in the face of, uh, as, they told, as they tell the king later, our God can't deliver us from your hand. And indeed he does. But they go on to say, but even if he does not, we will not worship the image you have set up. It's there so that we can understand the cost um, of turning back, so that we can understand the importance of obedience, so that we can understand and hold fast to the one who holds our lives in his hands. So that no matter what this life may bring to us, um, and let's face it, we all, none of us want to face hardship. None of us, none of us want to face persecution. Although many of our brothers and sisters throughout the world are going through that right now as we speak. But none of us want that. We'd be insane to want it. Um, <clears throat> but this helps us to understand that the importance of holding fast. Not because we're so strong. But because he is strong enough to hold on to us in the midst of all of those trials and all of those things. Amen. Father, we thank you so much that uh, in, in reading this, we were faced with the, the imagery of, uh, of the burning, the refining, the, the burning of refining that purifies us as silver and the, the image of the burning that destroys the wicked, those who refuse to submit themselves to you. And we ask that when we are discouraged, and we all face discouragement, there is not one of us who does not face discouragement at times. When we are discouraged, that you will help us to hold fast to you, not in our own strength, because we don't have the strength to do that, but holding on to the one who is always holding on to us. 
In Jesus' name, amen. And thank you very much. God bless you.